Morning, members, whoa, members and friends of Calvary. We are so happy to have you here in worship, and we are really blessed to be able to gather together to lift up the name of Jesus. Um, from 1 Corinthians 1, and this is the chapter that we're reading, but I thought this was appropriate. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ has been confirmed among you. You are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord. And we truly do thank God for each of you. We are pleased to be serving among you, and it's good to see your faces today. Our opening hymn today, as we begin Lent, we're going to be starting a series about the cross. And so we're going to be focusing on hymns that talk about the cross. We have communion today, and so we will be also singing about what the blood of Jesus has accomplished for us. And we'll start that focus with hymn number 362, Nothing But the Blood. If so you would stand with us if you are able, number 362. you to be seated. This hymn um, brings so much to us that I think rings true, at least in my own heart. In 40 plus years of being a Christian and following Jesus for such a long time, I've gone through so many ebbs and flows where I still think that there's something I can do to earn God's grace. And I work hard and I try hard and I get worn out and then God brings me back to the fact that it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. And that is really utter foolishness in the ways of the world, isn't it? Don't we teach our children that when they do good, they get the reward? When you work hard, you get your paycheck. 
Uh, when you serve your community, you gain that respect from your peers, but there's nothing that atones for sin and nothing that makes us white as snow outside of the blood of Jesus, and that doesn't make sense unless you are part of those who are called to know his grace. And that leads into our scripture lesson today, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love the story of the uh, seven-year-old boy who came home from Sunday school and his mother asked him, so what did you learn in Sunday school today? I said, well, Mom, uh, we learned about the Israel, people of Israel who came out of slavery in Egypt and they crossed the wilderness and they came to the Red Sea. And when they got there, they realized that they couldn't cross the Red Sea. So Moses called for the Israeli Corps of Engineers to build a pontoon bridge over the Red Sea so that the people could cross over it. And as the people were crossing over it, then the Egyptians decided they were going to attack, and so they came along, but because of their heavy tanks and heavy artillery, they got mired in the mud. And while they were mired in the mud, Moses called the Israeli Air Force and they bombed the Egyptians and that was the end of them. And mom reacted horrified. She said, is that really what they taught you in Sunday school? And the boy says, "Uh, no, not exactly. But if I told you what our teacher told us, you'd never believe it. Isn't it the truth? You know, we as Christians, we, we read the Bible, and we look at all the things that are written there, and we, we really say we believe it, but, but then, you know, we look at the miracles, and we look at all of this stuff in the Bible, and our sophisticated minds, our, our scientific minds, tend to, to disbelieve what's there. Say, well, we just explain it away. We have a hard time. And in fact, some people are really embarrassed to to present the Bible to people who don't know the Bible because, well, we don't think they'll believe it. And such is the case with the power of the cross. When you look at the the cross, we we find that it just doesn't make sense to us. Uh, the idea that someone would die on a cross, a very excruciating death, and that somehow that person would gain power over death, this doesn't make sense to us. Uh, this morning, we are beginning a series during the Lenten uh, period here on the power of the cross. We're going to be looking each Sunday at at how the cross makes a difference in our lives, what it does for us. And so we will discover that it's a very important thing. But it's a very difficult thing for us to grasp. 
it's, it's almost embarrassing. And so we will be taking a look at it from uh, this Christian perspective. Now, in ancient Rome, uh, the people were uh, not, uh, didn't believe in the uh, power of the cross. For many throughout history, the, the phrase power of the cross, it was an oxymoron. Romans uh, used the cross as an, uh, a, a means of demeaning people and um, allowing them to die a, a very cruel death. You hung up upon the cross naked and you uh, uh, died by asf- asphyxiation over a long period of time. So someone hanging on a cross was never mistaken as someone who was powerful. They were very weak. And even crosses today uh, don't seem all that powerful. We wear them as symbols around our neck. We uh, tend to uh, think of them as more jewelry than means of execution. But Christians maintain that the cross, at the cross, our sins were forgiven and death was defeated. And that seems very foolish to many people. Where's the power in the cross? From the human perspective, the cross is a contradiction. How can power come from something that's obviously weak? Well, the scripture passage this morning, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, just the, the idea of the power of the cross in a broader perspective. In the next weeks following, we'll, we'll look at uh, the various aspects of what the cross does for us. Um, and we'll take a look at how Paul explains this contradiction of, of the power of the cross. Uh, but I'll warn you, you need to, to really look at this, f- not from a human, limited human perspective, but from God's perspective, or you'll never get it. It'll never make sense. So, uh, let's take a look at that. Paul uh, begins his attempt to explain the unexplainable in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So you have folly uh, on on one side and you have power on the other side. Uh, The Jews of Paul's day uh, and before uh, generally categorized people into two groups. There were the, the Jews who were the people of God and then there were the Gentiles who were not people of God. It was pretty simple. You were either in the in-group or you are the out-group. And uh, the Greco-Roman culture, the Greeks and the Romans, also had basically two categories. You were either Greek or Roman, or you were a barbarian. You had those two choices. But Paul sets up another kind of category. Paul introduces a new way to distinguish among people. And his distinction is not racial or ethnical. It is uh, very different. He distinguishes among people according to their relation to Jesus Christ. You're either related to Jesus Christ or you're not. You may be a Jew or a Gentile, a Greek or a barbarian, any of those, and and still be a follower of Jesus Christ. Or you may be a Jew or barbarian or a Greek or Roman and not be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you reject Jesus Christ and the cross, you are perishing as far as Paul is concerned. And, and And you see the cross as something that is folly. You don't believe it. On the other hand, there are those who are being saved. 
those who are in the process of being saved. These are the people who believe and have trusted in Jesus as their Savior and are following him as their Lord. So again, you may be ethnically Jew or Gentile. Culturally, you may be Greek or barbarian, a Westerner or Middle Easterner. It doesn't matter. You are being saved if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins at the cross. Now, the distinction is important because whether you are perishing or being saved will determine your ability to understand the power of the cross. And it also will be able, uh, enable you to understand the wisdom of God. And it will also determine the power level of your humility. Now, let's take those who are perishing first. If they believe in God at all, they believe that they are smarter than God. Humans uh, who don't believe in God or don't believe that um, God is powerful uh, believe that humans have control. We are the smartest people, at least on the planet and, and maybe the universe. And so when we face a problem, such as climate change, for instance, uh, we don't think of addressing God and seeing what God wants us to do about it. We come up with our own solutions. Because, of course, we are the smart ones. Is the economy a wreck? We seek political solutions. We, we put our heads together. We come up with a, a way to solve the economy. You can count on humans to fix whatever is broken. As war raging, humans will find the path to peace. Those who are perishing believe that their wisdom and power are limitless. We believe that if we just work together, if we put our heads together, we can come up with solutions to anything that we face. But in verse 19, Paul quotes from Isaiah 29, verse 14, to demonstrate that human wisdom is no match for God's wisdom. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Uh, basically, what he's saying here is if you, anyone who wants to get in a battle of wits with God is going to lose. And God, if you are, are um, diverting away from God, he can mess up your mind so that you don't understand anything. You can't find a solution to anything. God is infinitely knowledgeable and infinitely wise, and we're not. Even the smartest person on earth has limits. He or she does not know everything there is to know and cannot know everything that there is to know. And so with that in mind, Paul does a little trash talking in verse 20. He says, where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And let's break this down. He's saying, where, where's the wise person? In other words, where are the philosophers who think that they have thought through all the possibilities and have figured life out and uh, have everything figured out? Where are these people? You know, we've had philosophers uh, throughout the ages. The Greeks, the Romans had their philosophers, and we're still not sure what life is all about. He says, where's the scribe? These are the religious experts who, who think that they can, they can define God and, and, and have uh, God under their thumb. God says, you don't have me under your thumb. 
who, where are those who think that they can win every argument, the debaters? They haven't taken God on, and if they have, they've lost. Now, we don't come to know God and God's wisdom through our own thinking process. It is through revelation. In verse 21, Paul demonstrates how it is that we come to know God. He writes, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God, through wisdom it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. I say it's not through wisdom that we come to know God. It's not through the, re- the reasoning process. It's really through revelation. It's through the folly of preaching. Today, people will say, well, uh, people don't have any uh, tolerance for preaching anymore. They don't, uh, we, we think in sound bites and we, we don't want to hear some talking head uh, in the, at the front of a church. And that may be true. But Paul's saying that it's that through the folly of preaching that we come to know God. Philosophers can't get to God. Scientists can't get us to God because they, they think empirically. They, they want empirical evidence that God is spirit. And so we can only look at what um, God effects, not what God is, is like in a physical terms. If we search for God in human terms, through human wisdom, we're not going to find him. Using human wisdom uh, will divert us, it will take us off course, and we will find all sorts of, of other false gods. We will in fact, elevate ourselves to God. So the the God we discover through human wisdom will be a a projection of our own fallenness. When we we search for God with our own wisdom, we we tend to create a God that is is controllable. He's, He's like us, only bigger, maybe better. Or, the opposite. We might look at God and say, he's not quite as good as we are. Many people have read the Old Testament and they, and they say, that, that God, I, I, I can't believe in that God. That God is, is vengeful and spiteful and, and just nasty. And so they reject that God. Or we come up with a God who uh, helplessly sits there in heaven uh, hoping that, that we're going to, to get things right. waiting to see what we're going to do so that he he knows how to make his next move. Or worse yet, we start to think that we're God. Look what we humans have come up with. We invented the internet. We, we We solve all of these medical problems. But God decided that he would not let humans dictate uh, who he is or who he's going to be. He decided to use a method that would appear foolish to the wise who belong to the world. He decided to use the cross. Cross. And the proclamation of the cross. Preaching. Preaching. To save those who would come to him by faith, who would believe, not just give mental assent, but who would believe, who would trust Jesus through that preaching, through that cross. In verse 22, Paul explains that the Jews and Greeks who are perishing demand proof of Christ's credentials on their terms. So on the one side, he says, you have the Jews 
who demand miraculous signs. They want signs. They look back in their history and they say, you know, Moses performed signs. Uh, he did miracles to, to get the people out of Egypt. Some of the prophets had signs. So we need to see signs. God had acted powerfully in their history. So any Messiah that came along needed to act powerfully. And so they demanded that Jesus show them signs to validate his credentials. Their idolatry had led them to believe that they could somehow control God, define God. So on the other, you had the Jews who wanted signs. On the other side, you had the Greeks who wanted wisdom. They wanted, uh, they wanted a, a philosopher who could explain the meaning of life, explain how to lead a good life. Um, and they were zealous for every kind of learning. Anything that, that uh, any theory that came down the pike, they would pay attention to it. They would uh, debate it. They would uh, learn from it. And their advancement in learning had led them to abandon their traditional gods, the, the, the Greek and Roman gods that you may have read about um, in English class. They, they didn't believe in them either, really, because that seemed folly to them. So their idolatry was to conceive of God as ultimate reason, a force rather than a personal God. So you have um, the Jews on one side, the Greeks on the other side. They show two basic uh, ways that we become idolatrous. Either God must function as the all-powerful or the all-wise, but always in terms of our own interests, or he is some vague philosophy. But here comes this person named Paul, and he starts preaching a crucified Messiah. Crucified Messiah. And the, and the Jews can't handle that because it doesn't make sense in their preconceived notions. The Greeks can't handle that because it, it's just stupid <laughs> to think of a Messiah. And so this idea of a crucified Messiah is a stumbling block, Paul says, to the Jews. We, can, we just can't handle that. We can't conceive that our Messiah, the one who's coming to save us, would be crucified on a cross. Anybody that was hanged on a tree was cursed. The Messiah wasn't supposed to be cursed. He was supposed to be our Savior. And for the Greeks, it was just foolish. The cross is nothing but superstition, according to them. It was madness to think that something good and powerful can come from something so obviously weak and powerless. And when we think about it, that's how we feel today, isn't it? I mean, we, many people tend to think of Jesus' death is just a tragic thing that happened. He made the wrong political moves and he was executed. And it's sad because, you know, he, he had so much promise. And we Christians may, may not believe that, but, but we really don't think of the cross as, as being the power behind our existence. We wear crosses around our necks. We have crosses in front of our sanctuaries and on our church buildings. They're symbols. But we've lost track of what it's a symbol of. It's a symbol of the foolish power of God. but it's still a stumbling block for Jews and Gentiles alike, and it's still folly 
to Jews and Gentiles alike. But, and this is a big but, Paul says that those who are called, those who are called to be followers of Jesus Christ, including both Jews and Gentiles, the cross of Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, in this life, we may never, ever fully understand the depth of the wisdom and the power of God that is in the cross. And quite frankly, if we wait until we, we figure it out, and, and, until we understand it fully, uh, we will never come to the cross. Thankfully, we don't need to fully understand it to experience that power. We just need to believe and trust that God knows what he's doing. And when Paul says that the message of the cross is God's wisdom, he is not speaking in philosophical terms or effectual terms. In other words, the wisdom of the cross is revealed by the fact that it works. The wisdom of the cross uh, is that it has the power to change us. It has the power to transform us into followers of Jesus Christ. So Paul wraps up this section of his letter by proclaiming that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. It's hard for us to understand. But, you know, to say that we're smarter than God or that we're the smartest people in the universe is really to say, uh, you know, that the ant that you're about to crush under your feet is smarter than you are. So, Paul wraps up this section of his letter by proclaiming that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. So we, so we need to quit being embarrassed by the gospel. We need to be, quit being embarrassed by what's in the Bible as if that's completely foolish. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It's the power of God. By going to the cross, Jesus unleashed, he unleashed the power of God. He he looked like he was weak on the cross, but he was at his ultimate strength. He was about to give the death blow to death. And human wisdom says, how can you defeat death by dying? We can't figure it out, and we're not meant to figure it out because God's wisdom is beyond us. Paul says, uh, God says in Isaiah, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Mine are higher than yours. I'm afraid that too many of us who call ourselves Christians bail out on a godly wisdom because we are afraid of looking foolish to the world. You know, we... The world tells us that a virgin birth is ridiculous or the crucifixion doesn't make any sense and we say, oh, okay, I don't want to look foolish so I won't, I won't preach that, I won't say that. If there is an apparent contradiction between the Bible and science, we immediately try to bring the Bible in line with science because we have a belief that science is infallible that the scientists have everything figured out. 
The world scoffs at the idea that God's word might be infallible. But they seem to accept the notion that human wisdom is infallible. We don't need to go to science or philosophy or even religion to validate the word of God. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. God has turned the tables on human wisdom. He thwarts it. Anyone who is working against God will end up working with futility. So, what about human wisdom versus God's wisdom? Well, we need to understand that few people maybe no people are going to be reasoned into believing in Jesus and accepting him as Lord and Savior. If you play by the world's idea of reason, you will be wasting your time. You can't debate people into, into heaven. The Holy Spirit is either working in, on them and in them and drawing them to God, or he's not. It's not that the gospel is unreasonable. It's it's just that those who are perishing, as Paul says, will not get it. They they won't understand. So so here's how we will win people to Jesus Christ. Here's how we will uh, understand it ourselves. They will be won to Jesus by our love, our service, and our proclamation of the cross which is God's ultimate demonstration of his love for us. Jesus loved us so much that he went to the cross. So if it it comes to looking wise in human eyes or God's eyes, I'll pick God's eyes every time. You know, I don't like looking foolish, but if... If I look foolish in front of other people, that's fine. Because I don't want to be among the perishing. To look for acceptance among the so-called wise people of this age is to be the ultimate fool. The wisdom of the world ends in death, and the wisdom of God results in eternal life. So let's embrace the foolish power of the cross. Let's pray. Father, after years and years of studying the Bible and even preaching it, I still struggle in in, in um, grasping the power of the cross. My mind just doesn't conceive how it works. How you defeat death by dying. But it says it in your word, I need to trust it. So I pray that um, all of us here in this room and, and within the sound of my voice will will truly draw near to you and that you will open their spiritual eyes and they will see the power of the cross, the wisdom of the cross, your wisdom in the, in the folly of preaching and in your word. Lord, I pray that we will use our human reason, our human understanding to um, seek you and to follow you and to trust you. And we thank you for how you have revealed to us uh, ways that we can um, find healing in in disease and um, how we can um, experience the um, marvels of, of technological advances. You know, that's a gift from you because you created our brains. 
But we pray that you will show us that it's not through our wisdom or our um, power that we come to know you. Father, um, I also want to um, lift up to you today those um, in the Ukraine who are experiencing uh, just absolute uh, horror, danger. I pray, Lord, that you will um, surround the Ukrainians with your love, your protection. Lord, give them peace and hope in the midst of um, this devastating um, time in their history. Lord, we pray for those um, who have family members and friends who lost their lives in the uh, tornadoes yesterday. I pray, Lord, that you will give them comfort and hope and peace. Lord, I I ask that your grace may abound in, in all those who are experiencing loss or struggle or pain. I pray that you will give them your hope through your wisdom. Father, as we prepare for communion today, we ask that you will examine our hearts, that you will um, cleanse our hearts, that you will... Um, as you have promised to do, forgive us our, our sins. And Lord, right now, I want to invite um, those here um, preparing for communion to prepare their hearts. Uh, let us all um, share in silence uh, our confession to God and seek his cleansing this morning. Hear the good news. First John, in First John, we hear that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You are forgiven. Father, thank you for that promise. And Lord, we end by praying the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into the power deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Apostle Paul, uh, later in the book of 1 Corinthians, his letter to the Corinthians, writes these words, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and he gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, 
which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to his heavenly Father and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, drink. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so that's what we do. As United Methodists, as Christians, we continue to remember the Lord's death until he comes and we remember the power of the cross, what happened at the cross, that he can transform us into people who are living eternally in him. I want to remind you that uh, in the United Methodist Church, you do not have to be a member uh, of our denomination or the local church in order to take communion. We just ask that you uh, be a follower of Jesus and that you uh, seek to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and just a reminder, um, where we're doing communion, um, could I have you, Gary? Uh, Gary will uh, dismiss the rows to come up. Uh, you can go on each side of the, of the uh, communion rail. You can kneel or you can um, stand if you would like. And I will bring the elements around if you would hold them until we can take uh, them together. Um, that would be wonderful. Christ's body was broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. Christ's blood shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him.
Christ's body was broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of him. And Christ's blood was shed for you. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always and forever. And may his peace reside in your hearts. Amen. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes these words. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is the base verse for our closing hymn. This says, Ask ye what great thing I know, number 163, and may we proclaim together that we will know nothing, at least in comparison, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I invite you to stand, number 163. <laughs> Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.
congregational benediction during the month of Lent will be the chorus to that mighty hymn, Lift High the Cross.